I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to make a video that's hopefully gonna be brief, but I have not been able to do a brief video in a while. Um, this is actually part of a kind of coming out of a conversation I had today that I thought you know some of this stuff is really important. Um, and I don't like to speculate too much about prophecy stuff. Um, and this is gonna be a little bit about why. Uh, I really do believe that the complexion of the world in the tribulation is going to be dramatically different than what we see today. Now, all the, all the scriptures will be fulfilled literally, but a lot of things we are attributing to the beast are actually belong to mystery Babylon. And the more I've learned, I used to study it a lot and I haven't as much lately, but the Lord's led me away from that because it's so dark. But Mystery Babylon, I think that we are not real clear about what it is, which is makes sense. It's a mystery. Um, if you say it's just Rome, you're not thinking big enough. If you say it's just America, you're not thinking big enough. <laughs> I believe that Mystery Babylon is the present world order. Um, th the statue that Daniel saw in chapter 2, Daniel 2, where he saw the, uh, well, Nebuchadnezzar saw the statue in his dream. Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Daniel told him, look, the head of this statue is Babylon. Wait, really, you are this head, but the golden head was Babylon. Um, but then from that would proceed the other metallic alloy uh, portions of the figure that represented the various world empires, Greece, Persia, and Rome, right? Uh, and Rome, legs of iron would break in half. Um, and then at the end, there's a final kingdom that is made up of the ten toes of iron with clay. And we assume that we're looking at that a lot of times. I mean, even, and I love Chuck Missler and Hal Lindsey and, you know, all the, all the good prophecy teachers that we've had in our generation, but they still tended to focus on trends uh, today to say this is the formation of the 10 kings, you know, the 10 regions of the earth. Which I get it, Club of Rome and all that. I, I understand where they're coming from. But they're looking at Babylon and calling it the beast. That's the problem. Um, the beast system does not emerge until Babylon is destroyed. And again, I believe Babylon, Mystery Babylon, represents the entire present world order that has its roots in Babylon. Um, and there's a priesthood, a religion associated with it that goes back to Babel and Nimrod and Semiramis and Tammuz, you know. Um, but uh, also there's a military, there's a political and an economic aspect. All of our systems are descended from Babylon. It's the head meaning it's the brain, the organizational center of everything that would come next in the Gentile world empires. And what we're seeing today, what we live in, is Mystery Babylon. Uh, it's the matrix, so to speak. And even when John talks about the ten kings that arise, which are given power for one hour, and then they give their power to the beast, right? Uh, and in the days of those ten kings, the Lord will set up his kingdom, according to Daniel. Um, those are the ten toes and the ten horns. They are not visible yet. And when John sees them, what he's looking at is not them at first, but Mystery Babylon. The woman rides the beast. The beast is submerged, submerged under the water. 
and there's this whore, this woman riding the beast, and it's the woman that he marvels at, and he's greatly astonished. It, this drunken woman, he just can't believe what he's looking at. And now eventually the beast does rise up, but he the beast rises by devouring the woman and consuming her flesh. And I believe that means taking over everything and destroying the present world empire, or the present world order, sorry. It's hard for me to even speak to because I want to speak to it succinctly without having to get into a whole bunch of history and all that stuff, you know. The point I want to make is that what we see with our eyes and our senses today is not what I believe the tribulation saints are going to be looking at. I believe that there is another order that will come and it's fa it's different than all the ones that precede it and it's completely uh it's very fast and it's made up of the parts of the things that preceded it but it's different and even the antichrist when he comes is going to come worshiping a god that none of his fathers worshiped a strange god god of forces there will be a whole new thing a rejection of everything that went before and a destruction of the previous world order which the whole world will hate the whore the whole world hates her and devours her flesh and then this beast system arises out of the nations all the nations it emerges very quickly it's uh something unlike anything we can imagine because it's animated by a spirit the beast spirit and you know the beast comes out of the abyss according to i think revelation 9 uh the beast being the antichrist ascends from the abyss led by its king apollyon and apollyon in the greek is corresponds with Tammuz, who is the son of Nimrod and Samaramis, the unholy trinity of the original Babylonian religion in Babel. Okay, and if you understand that trinity, you will understand the root of the world religions that are in opposition to Christ. And it is a false trinity with Nimrod, who had the sign of the dragon, and uh, also was associated with the sun for illumination um, as the god and when he was killed by Semiramis his wife she deified him and said he was he was god incarnate he, that's the origin of apotheosis that he became a god okay and even the scripture says he became a gibberim and gibberim is the same word for the giants before the flood, the Nephilim, um, the tyrants. There's some kind of supernatural occultic transaction going on with this tr couple, Semiramis and Nimrod. And they were building an empire of blasphemy against God. And Semiramis killed him and created a religion and associated with him, him with the sun and herself with the moon. And they were the male and female components of this religion. And then their seed, Tammuz, was said to be, she, she actually capitalized on the promise of the seed of the woman and told the populace that he was Messiah. And he is Baal, by the way. He's the same, it, it, that religion, when Babel was scattered and the tribes of the earth was scattered into different languages, that religion with its priesthood went with the different people groups and the names of the gods changed fragmented and changed but at the core it all comes back to this mother child queen of heaven moon goddess and her son uh you know the the son of she, she's the mother of god and her husband the son uh, dragon Nimrod and that's what Baal worship is all about 
Baal worship is the worship of a false Christ brought forth by Semiramis, who was, by the way, the mother of all abominations in earth. She's the one who started temple prostitutes with the idea that people could communion with commune with demons because she wanted to bring back the Nephilim. And that is not biblical tradition. That's a cultic tradition. If, you, if you've ever studied that stuff, it's dark. I haven't studied it in years, but that's what they believe. And that's what Masons are anticipating is that there would be a return to the pre-flood days where the gods of old who supposedly shepherded mankind and taught him would return to lead man into a Luciferic initiation, a Luciferian initiation into a new age of enlightenment. And it's the same promise as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You'll be like God, right? Um, your eyes will be open. That's their religion. And they believe that Tammuz is coming back. Tammuz died. Apparently she killed him too. And when he died, he, he, he was celebrated as, by the way, when his dad died, Nimrod, he was celebrated as the incarnation of God on earth. Uh, when he died, there was this myth that he would resurrect. And he, that, that is where Christmas and Easter come from. Christmas celebrates his birth, the birth of Tammuz. Easter celebrates... Easter comes from Astarte, which is another name for Semiramis, Tammuz's mom. But it celebrates his the fertility, which represents the coming together of the male and female aspects of this satanic religion, Nimrod and Semiramis, which really are both archetype, archetypes of the two sides of Satan, male and female. He, he's represented as the Baphomet, and he's male and female. It's so dark, you guys. Uh, but they anticipate that Tammuz will return. And when he does, he'll bring with him the gods of old. And that's what the opening of the abyss is, I believe, by Apollyon in Revelation 9. That kingdom, the beast system, will come out of the abyss. It has not emerged yet. So, And the abyss is, on the one hand, the sea. On the other hand, it's the place where God locked the angels up in Tartarus because of their sin prior to the flood. So you're dealing with something totally supernatural, totally something that doesn't look anything like what we're dealing with today. But the religion and the world system today was created by these beings uh, as a kind of psyop on the human race. And our cultures that we've inherited all come from them. And they are going to destroy that culture in order to bring forth a new one because they believe in order out of chaos. They're going to create the chaos that then they will bring forth their child, which will be the beast system. They create what they want to destroy. It's, it's very interesting because it's a psychological operation. They build up something in man's mind and call that evil. And then they destroy it by what they then call good so that mankind believes what they're bringing in is good. And the beast system will look good because it'll destroy what everybody has come to believe is evil, which is the present world system represented by this drunk whore who's actually Semiramis. And the, the, you know, the mythology is that she killed her husband and her son. And so there's a perpetual enmity between them, the Nimrod and Babel and, and Semiramis, and yet they're destined to come together again to bring forth the Apollyon or the, their, their seed. The seed of, this is the seed of the serpent, pretending to be Christ. I mean, that's how crazy this stuff is. If you have not studied that stuff, and I knew Chuck Missler hadn't studied that stuff, and Hal Lindsey hadn't really studied that stuff too much. Uh, if you don't understand their religion and what they and and the amount of control they have in the world um, through their priesthoods, uh, which are not which are everywhere, then and this all sounds like crazy talk, I know. Then when you read the Bible, 
when you get to the prophetic stuff, you try to interpret all the prophetic trends in the light of things that Babylon is doing and think it's the beast. And Babylon is a deceiver. She is an enchantress. She knows God's religion too. She knows that, and this is, when we say she, we're really talking about the female side of Satan, the spirit that operates in the sons of disobedience, the spirit that operates in the world. Uh, through manipulation and flattery and cunningness and enchanting and, and deceiving misrepresentation. And she's got her fingers in everything. And what she puts out is called the wine of her fornication that she causes all the nations to drink of. And through her wine, she deceives all the nations. All the nations are deceived. And unfortunately, this personage is represented by Jezebel, who was the priestess of Astarte, uh, and brought that religion into the camp in Israel. And Jesus said to the church of Thyatira that she, she's tolerated again. And this is a spirit. And she causes his servants, genuine servants, to commit fornication and drink and eat things sacrificed to idols. Well, what are they drinking? The wine of her fornication. There's this beast that is being ridden by a woman that John sees. And she caused all the nations to drink of the wine of her fornication, and they're all drunk. She's drunk, they're drunk. The church, is, the, the, church the servants of God, genuine, have also been defiled by this wine. Okay? And this wine is her enchantment. It's her witchcraft. It's, the, it's her false ideas and false doctrines is seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. It's a spiritual war. It's the principalities arrayed against the church through vain imaginations and exalted concepts that uh, exalt themselves against the knowledge of God, doctrines of demons, seducing spirits, anything that is in contrast to sound doctrine is Jezebel's wine or this Semiramis wine, this mother of harlots wine, who pretends to be the queen, you know, and thinks she has all control. Uh, it's really interesting. That, but let's just look at what he says. He carried me away into the wilderness. Okay, now, by the way, the Revelation 12 sign he saw in the heavens, this sign he's going to say in the wilderness I always wondered about that because there was nothing in me that ever said that the Revelation 12 sign was astrological just because it's associated with the heavens. If you say it's associated with the heavens and therefore it's astrological, then what do you do with this woman who's associated with the wilderness? What does the wilderness correspond to? <laughs> you know, I, these signs are spiritual. They are uh, emblematic of spiritual themes in the scripture. Not things that you can look at with your eyes and say, oh, there's the Revelation 12 sign. I saw it out my window. That's not what that is. I'm not saying that there's not an arrangement of stars that point to these things, but those are not the very thing. Okay. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet covered colored beast. Okay, so she's sitting on the beast. Full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and seven ten horns. So she's kind of one with this thing. He sees the woman riding the beast. And the beast has the ten horns. But then he's back to the woman. The woman is arrayed in purple and scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her head, forehead, was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the great mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Now, I believe the blood of the saints is distinct from the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. They're both saints, but the saints, I believe he's talking about Old Testament. I don't believe that this is someone that just, this woman is, is new. She's the mother of all abominations in the earth. She's the source. She's the mother of harlots. So that can't be Rome. This pre-exists Rome, predates, And she's drunk with the blood of the saints, which I believe is all um, the people of God that have been martyred. 
and I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, blood of the martyrs, and I, when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. He's like, what is this? He says, why do you war marvel? I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names are not written in the book of the life and the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is and not and and is not and yet is. Now again, that's a pointing us back to Revelation 9 with Apollyon and the beast that ascends out of the abyss. Okay. Um, the whole world is going to wonder and marvel at that thing. Uh, it has not come forth yet. It's The abyss has not been opened. So you can't say that the ten kings are on the earth today. Okay. Uh, you know, at this point, if they know anything about it, they don't know what it is. And the beast is not on the earth today either. Now, there could be a human being that the beast inhabits. Okay, but you can't say that Obama is the anarchist. You cannot say these things definitively because you just don't know. It has not been revealed yet. It has not been, it has not occurred. And here's the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Now, those seven mountains are seven kingdoms. You say, oh, that's Rome, city of seven hills. No, it's seven successive kingdoms. And there are seven kings, five have fallen, one is. Nero was the one at that time. And the other is not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue for a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seventh and goes into perdition. What? He's the eighth, but he's of the seven? Yeah, because if he's the, if he is... Nimrod, he, or Tammuz, sorry, he's a king that already was, went into perdition, and is going to return when he's let out of the pit. So he's of the seven former kingdoms, but he'll also be the eighth. It's a recapitulation of Babel, the original. And the ten horns which you saw are ten kings which have received no kingdom yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. They don't receive their power until the beast receives his power, and he's in the abyss. Okay. And they will make war with the lamb himself. And the lamb will overcome them, for he's Lord of Lord, King of Kings. And they which are with him are called and chosen and faithful. That's when he returns with his saints, who have already been gathered to him, by the way. And he said to me, the waters which you saw where the horse sits are peoples, multitudes, and nations, and tongues. And the ten horns you saw of the beast, these will hate the whore and make her desolate and naked and eat her flesh and burn her with fire. That's where we get the idea that Babylon's going to be judged by fire. Nuked or whatever, I don't know. For God has put it in his heart to fulfill his will and degree and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Now at that time, the Roman Catholic Church had not been a thing yet. I believe eventually Roman Catholic Church is part of that system and was the expression of it for a while and will be again in some sense, but it's bigger than that. This city is, is a mystery that exerts its power uh, in secret, not directly, but in the form of a mystery that it takes revelation to see and some knowledge to see. You've got to know about the priesthoods and the belief systems that are behind the money and the finances and the ideas that shape the present wow. world to understand what this city is. It's, is it a physical city? No. Any more is the city of New City Jerusalem, which is contrasted to this whore, is not a physical city, although many people believe it is. The city of God is the church, Zion. The city of the living God. We are the household of God, the habitation of God, the dwelling place of God. Uh, that takes spiritual insight to see too. You know, the same... 
people who are going to say that Babylon is America are also not going to be able to be open to the idea that the New Jerusalem is an entity, the Lamb's wife. It's a person, not a physical place. And the stones are the transformed precious stones, the regenerated believers who have been glorified and built together to become the habitation of God, his eternal temple, his dwelling place forever. Um... But he says, after these things, another angel came down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory, and the voice said, Babylon, the greatest fallen, fallen has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit, cage of every unclean spirit, bird, for all nations have drunk the wine of wrath of her fornication. This is how she rules, is through the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. See, it's through marriage, it's through a intercourse that she rules not overtly not directly where you know she's in power but behind the scenes like Jezebel you know she was really running the show in Ahab's household but Ahab was the figurehead and that's how Jezebel has always worked or Babylon has always worked behind the scenes through influence okay it's a religion that has uh, this wine that is her enchantment through which she deceives the nations and causes the kings to commit fornication. But also, remember in Thyatira, he, Jesus said that Jeze they tolerate Jezebel who teaches and seduces his servants to commit fornication. They are drink and drink things sacrificed to idols. They are drinking the wine. That's why we see so much drunkenness in the church. Not physical drunkenness, spiritual drunkenness. No, not in contrast to a sober mind, going after seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, and not tolerating sound doctrine. Christ is the unleavened bread, and He is the feast. He is our food, and He's our drink. And in contrast to Him, is Jezebel's wine. And sound doctrine versus sensationalism is the difference between being sober and drunk in God's kingdom. Sensationalism has to do with the senses. And the senses are titillated by, Jez by well, this whore through her wine. And they make you drunk. When in the prophetic community, there's so little sobriety. And in fact, at least 90% of the time we're finding they don't even have the gospel right. Another person, you know, exposed today, who's considered to be a reasonable prophecy watcher. Turned out he isn't right on the gospel, you know. Uh, and yet, so many are drunk, not heeding sound doctrine, not watching for Christ himself as the risen one in us, in the church, as the food and drink but looking at sensational news headlines and sensational coalescence of events in the world, which I believe is part of her wine. See, Babylon, this priesthood, they know the prophecies. They took advantage of the prophecy of the seed of the woman to bring forth Tammuz and set him up as the God King of the world that people were believing was the Messiah, but it was really Baal. It was a false, hard taskmaster Messiah who killed everybody who didn't bow the knee to him and en enforced them to engage themselves in spiritual idolatry and fornication at the point of death. And you see that especially when Jezebel marries Ahab and brings that religion, the Astarte priesthood, which is Semiramis and Babel and Tammuz, uh, into the camp and kills all the prophets of Baal, I'm sorry, prophets of God, except Elijah and a few others, and replaces them with her eunuchs, and replaces the worship of God with the worship of Baal at point of death, but intermingles it with God's worship so that they're using the temple and the sacrifices. And even when she had uh, Naboth killed, um, she set him up and lied and said he was committing witchcraft and blasphemies the people thought they were serving Jehovah when they stoned him to death but actually it was children of Belial who lied about him 
and said he had committed witchcraft, and this was all at the behest of Jezebel, the, who was the daughter of the priest of Astarte. It was the mingling of the outward form of God's religion, but corrupting it with the influence of this satanic Luciferian counterfeit. And that's how she works. And that's her wine. She seduced Ahab, and Ahab's marriage with her shouldn't have been because he should have married inside the camp, uh, one of his tribe, you know. But no, he married outside, which is a kind of fornication. And then she got him involved with spiritual idolatry. Well, he, Jesus said that Jezebel is doing it again to his church. So we should not be surprised to see God's servants, who are legitimately saved and are going to get raptured, also being drunk with the wine. And that's why Paul warned in Thessalonians to be sober and not be drunk with the world. Drunk on what? Her wine. She caused all the nations to drink of it. Okay, she rules over the kings of the earth. All of the kingdoms in the present wor world order are drunk with the wine of this whore. Uh, all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. The merchants of the earth are waxed wit rich through the abundance of her delicacies. So she influences financially and spiritually uh, and ideologically and gets involved behind the scenes. These are the bankers. This is the masons. This is the Illuminati. And they are a priesthood. You have to know what they believe. And they link everything back to Babel and this unholy trinity. And they know what they're doing. Okay? And they know the church they know the prophecies that the church is anticipating. And I believe that they are cynically exercising a psyop on the church. They can't stop the fulfillment of prophecy, but they can pretend to fulfill it. It's not an accident that the Abraham Accord is happening and all these these world leaders know the prophecies. They're not stupid. They know that they're fulfilling the Bible. Okay? And God will use that. He is fulfilling prophecy. But they are also doing a cynical work of witchcraft right in front of our very eyes to dupe us and to seduce us away from Christ and get us so drunk and distracted with their world system. And when they destroy it, What's going to emerge is going to look like Christ, but it'll actually be the beast. But many will think that the beast actually was destroyed. That's the whole thing. Is that Satan created a definition of evil like a straw man. He created a version of himself that's a joke. It's a parody. Satan. With the goat, you know, calf feet, the Baphomet, the uh, horns, and all the things we associate with evil... But when he reveals himself, he's going to reveal himself as the beautiful light bearer. And everybody's going to believe it's the real Christ that just put down and destroyed the evil world order, which was actually Babylon. And that's why I think it's really dangerous that the church is being led to believe that what's happening on the stage right now is the beast system. Okay, it's not. It's the whore. Ah. Uh, and now, I know this is radical. This is I, I, I might only share this one with a couple friends because I'm not doing it justice to back it up with solid empirical information. I don't have time, and I don't want to get that deep into it. And you could say it's speculation and it's a theory, and that may very well be. You could just like set it aside. Don't take this as dogmatic. But I believe this is my perspective of what's going on. Um... But there's a command to God's people. Come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. The judgment is coming first to the house of God, to this false system. Remember Jesus said to the church of Thyatira, you have Jezebel, you tolerate her. She's causing my servants to commit adultery. But there's some of you who know the depths of Satan and are having committing adultery with her and you will not repent I gave her space to repent she will not I will cast her into the bed I will cast her children into great tribulation and I will kill them with death and those who commit adultery with her 
Those are the strongest words that Jesus has ever said to anybody associated with the church. And it's because they are false believers who know the depths of Satan, meaning they understand this mystery of Babylon religion. And they are knowingly introducing this witchcraft and seduction to God's servants to get them drunk. They know they're doing it. You just have no idea how evil the wolves are. Real wolves. There are witches. There are people that have infiltrated the flock that know the form of doctrine but have an agenda to corrupt it and gut it and replace it with mass mystery Babylon practices. And uh, I wrote a book about that a while ago, but I can't bring it out. It's too dark. <laughs> uh, it, it, Helena Blas Blavatsky and Alice Bailey wrote about what they were going to do a hundred years ago in the Theosophical Movement to gut Christianity of Orthodox believers in the pulpit and replace them basically with Babylonian eunuchs to guide the church out of the Orthodox faith and into what we would call New Age practices or Babylonian mystery. The NAR and the Emergent Church are doing it. They're actually operating knowingly with fallen angels and demons to get God's people involved with Satan. That's Satan's biggest, you know, he wants to be worshipped, but he wants to do it on the Assembly of the North. and He wants to be worshipped in the great congregation. He wants to replace God. That's his goal, is to actually replace God so that people who think they're worshipping God end up worshipping Satan. It would be his ultimate triumph to see God's people worshipping, directing the worship that belongs to God to him. And that's what he does. With Baal worship, you've got a false Christ. Antichrist and false Christ is Baal. He is the Antichrist. Tammuz, Apollyon. It's a literal thing that's going to emerge. And all false worship and infiltration is directed at seducing God's servants who think they're worshiping God to worship Antichrist instead. That's what the Roman Catholic Church thing is. You know, the, the, the uh, continual sacrifices, they are where the priest has authority to sacrifice Jesus again and again and again in a bloodless sacrifice is a blasphemy that people died at the died and were burned and killed uh, because they would not partake of it. They, the Inquisitions, they suffered the worst tortures. And this woman is drunk with the blood of the saints because it's always been punishable by death if you do not worship Baal. And those who had eyes to see and ears to hear knew they could not partake in the Roman Catholic communion because that was not Christ. It was a blasphemous mockery of the sacrifice of Christ. Which See, Baal's work is never finished. He's a false Christ whose blood does not atone for you. His work is not finished, his offering is not done, and he's a taskmaster. And he gets you involved in a mockery of the true Christ while thinking that you are worshiping the true Christ. That's Satan's parody. That's the mockery of God. He's drunk with it. Okay, and this woman is drunk with the wine, uh, which for her is the blood of the saints. She persecutes through the nations, through this wine, by setting up a system that stigmatizes true belief and makes it look evil, you know. Meanwhile, she's setting up as this whore that all the nations are going to hate. And when they devour her, they're going to think that this is the coming of the kingdom. There will be many so-called Christians who are going to believe the lie. They're going to worship Antichrist because they didn't receive the love of the truth or delivered over to strong delusion. Many of the ones who are drunk now, who are not clear on the gospel, are being delivered over to strong delusion through the drunkenness. They're drinking the wine of her fornication, and that wine is going to betroth them to Antichrist. And they're going to think that they've just defeated the world system. Okay, and that's what the NAR is all about. They believe that they are going to actually bring in the kingdom and defeat the Antichrist system before Christ can come. And the nations are going to rise up against Mystery Babylon 
and absolutely destroy it. And they believe they're going to believe they're doing a good thing. And then their king is going to rise out of the abyss. And they're going to wonder at it. Those whose names were not in the Lamb's Book of Life. They received not the love of the truth. They rejected the gospel. They believed the lie of the whore. Then they devoured the whore. Uh, and set up a kingdom that Jesus himself will judge. Uh, but he says, For her sins have reached into heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you a double unto her double according to her works and the cup which she has filled to her double how much she's glorified herself and lived deliciously so much torment and sorrow give her for she says I sit as a queen and have no widow and shall see no sorrow and that's her religion too she believes that Nimrod in the person of Tammuz is going to come back from the dead so she's not a widow um, therefore shall her plagues come upon her in one day death and famine and mourning and she will be utterly burned with fire, strong as the God who judges her. Now that is going to take place at the beginning of the tribulation. That's the setup for the beast system to arise. See, don't think of everything in Revelation as sequential. It's signs that have their manifestation in a specific order in time. It's kind of, and I'm not going to get into all that, but... The kings of the earth who've committed fornication with her and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her that they see the smoke of her burning. Okay. And, and, and all of her the whole world order is going to collapse. This is going to be the financial reset. Okay. Um, but the burning, I don't know. I think there's going to be earthquake and fire and hailstones as well as nukes. And this whole world order is going to destroy at the beginning of the day of the Lord, the first event on earth appears to be a great earthquake that shakes, moves the mountains out of their place and destroys the cities. And the people of the earth, great and small, all are hiding in the rocks. And we know there's underground bases, but we think, oh, the elite are there. No. At that point, the whole world is going to go hide. At this point, the population is not, not conditioned to go hide. But at that time, they will be. <laughs> we don't even know where how to get into the base right now. Where are the bases? I don't know. Do they even exist? Well, eventually, it'll be a public thing, you know. And when they hide, they're going to be knowingly hiding from the wrath of the Lamb. They are going to be the ones that set up the beast system. The whole thing is crazy, okay? I, the point I'm making, or trying to make, terribly, is that the complexion of that thing is so different than we've been led to believe that just looking at the world trends politically right now she knows what she's doing she's cynically seducing the church and running a massive psyop to get us thinking that the prophecies are being fulfilled and they are but jesus remember when he came fulfilled every prophecy right under the nose of the pharisees who knew the prophecies and yet he did it in a way to befuddle them only those who were poor in spirit could actually recognize him. And it's the same way now. We cannot go by what we see with our eyes. We have to go by the word and the doctrine of Christ, which is the pure unleavened bread that we're to eat and drink that, that is our feast. The blood of Christ and the flesh of Christ, which he said, my words are spirit and they are life. You have to abide in the doctrine of Christ. If you depart from it, you will be drunk, asleep, even if you think you're watching, because you're watching the wrong things. And this has been on me again and again all year. This is why I went into the book of John, and you can look at my John playlist. The main emphasis in it was that the Lord is leading us, a group of people. He's sanctifying us with the washing of the water of the word from drunkenness and idolatry in Babylon. He says, come out of her, my people, and be separate and touch not the unclean thing. That's to, uh, an admonition to us. And we can't, if it's America, we can't practically move from America. No, this is a world system that has a religious component that has deceived all the nations and the seduced God's servants. And honestly, in the prophetic thing, we really, we know we're at the time. We know we're at the beginning of sorrows because of what the earth is doing, and Israel's been brought back into the land. Those things are things that God organized. 
But there's a lot of other things that we're calling the fulfillment of prophecy, which are really just sensational speculations that are getting people drunk. In contrast to that is the pure word of Christ. And the other thing is that the apostles told us to look for an apostasy in the church. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, Jude, 1 and 2 Peter, and Thessalonians all tell us that people will not tolerate sound doctrine. They'll heap up for their te themselves teachers after their own lust. They'll go after fables and myths. They will go after seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. They will not heed the word. They'll depart from the faith. And we're told to contend for the faith that was once delivered and to expect a sea of delusion. And Ephesians tells us that we're supposed to be putting on the armor to stand in the evil day because we're actually wrestling with the principalities. They are directly attacking the church. And they've directly attacked the church through belief systems, through this wine, which is ideological, uh, doctrinal, uh, sensational, all kinds of ways to get people to believe warped things and get them drunk and not sober. Again, what is drunk? It means to be drunk with the wine of her, her fornication, which is financial, it's political, it's sensational, it's spiritual. There's the spirits. It's unclean. Okay, it's got idols. Every aspect of the world system is part of her wine. And we're not to love the world. And God's wanting to sanctify us out of it all. And the only way to be sanctified is through the knowledge of the truth, which is Christ himself. See, it's not that God wants us to be experts on this stuff. What he wants us to see is that there's this whole body of unclean stuff that we're drowning in. That we need to come out of. And the only way to come out is through the washing of the water of the word. Sanctification through belief in the truth. And abiding in the doctrine of Christ. And having our eyes open. That's what it means to really be watching. You hold fast to what you have and let no one steal your crown. We're standing in the evil day. Wrestling with the principalities and we need to have our armor on. Paul said in Thessalonians that since we know he's coming, we have to be sober and put on the breastplate of love and faith and put on our helmet, the hope of salvation. This is what our watching is a warfare watching. If you don't realize where, what the nature of the war is, and you're just thinking, well, if I watch the news and understand what's happening in Israel and look at what this pope's doing, and there's people who are dogmatically saying this pope is the false prophet. That's stupid. You don't know that. He hasn't called fire down from heaven. He's not fulfilled these prophecies. The beast has not emerged from the pit. We're looking at Babylon right now, not the beast system. And the church shouldn't even be thinking about the beast system because we're going to be out of here. Uh, that's for another group of people to speak to, the 144,000 and the two witness. We do not understand what that time is going to look like. We may think we do because we are analyzing all the trends today and saying, well, this is probably that and projecting. But I'm telling you, that world order will be different than everything that went before it. And it will be after the destruction a complete psyop which absolutely breaks the psyche of the human race so that the entire humanity is brought through a trauma-based mind control thing and through a crisis so cataclysmic that it absolutely shakes off everything that they used to think was true and no we're in the middle of it but it's not here yet and you gotta cling to the truth which is only christ it's found in christ Gosh, I wish I could express this burden without sounding crazy. This is the craziest message I've ever given. I know it. But this is my burden, and this is why I fight so much. Because I know what the enemy is trying to do. And I see people less and less sober, less and less tolerant of the truth. And they're God's servants. They're actually his servants that are drinking this wine. They're not going to listen to me either. They hate me. But I, that doesn't mean they're not saved. They just think I'm bad news because I talk like this and I discount their theories and say, no, there's something deeper going on. You know. Now, I believe with them that we're almost out of here. But what we're looking for at is different. We should be looking at the spiritual condition of the church and those around us. We should be watching our crown and guarding it and letting no one steal it. And we should be keeping the feast 
and coming out of everything that's unclean and and recognize the difference between the true prophetic word which is the testimony of jesus christ and what is passing as the prophetic word which is really sensationalism which is just another aspect of this whore's wine you know <sighs> that's causing everybody to be drunk okay i'm gonna get going i, I th this is i don't know if i'm gonna post this or not oh my gosh it's 50 minutes <laughs> all right talk to you later